My name is Dr David Grummet. I'm a Senior Research Fellow at the History of Parliament Trust. For the past 15 years, the History of Parliament has been working on MPs, the biographies of MPs who sat in Henry VI's parliaments between 1422 and 1460. It's some of that information that hopefully I'll be bringing to bear today on the question of why were there wars between Lancastrians and Yorkists. For nearly 400 years, the origins of the Wars of the Roses lay in the fundamental weakness of the late medieval English polity. Tudor historiography, and especially Shakespeare's plays, appear, appear to make the story of the Wars of the Roses inevitable. The usurpation of Henry IV in 1399, the struggle between Edward IV and Henry VI in the middle of the 15th century, leading, of course, to the accession of Henry VII in 1485. Bishop Stubbs, writing in the middle of the 19th century, saw the origins of the Wars of the Roses, really, in the reign of Edward III. Edward made three principal mistakes which paved the way for the conflict which marked much of the 15th century. First, Edward allowed nobles to raise men for war by contract. These noblemen then used these bands of armed retainers to subvert royal justice and create disorder at a local level. Secondly, in his insatiable desire to conquer France, Edward had weakened the English crown financially, making it beholden to Parliament to raise taxation. Richard Cowper, writing uh, a couple of decades ago, characterised this as a move from the law state, where the king's lordship and the administration of justice was the key element in royal government, to the war state, where war and raising money for taxation governed the relationships between the king and his subjects. Finally, and most crucially, Edward seriously mishandled uh, the royal family. Edward was fortunate in, enough in one way to have five sons who survived to adulthood. But in augmenting their estates and granting away much of the royal patrimony to these sons, Edward fatally undermined the wealth and status of the crown. And it was these sons, Edward III's sons, who provided the rival claimants to the English throne in the 15th century. The question for historians writing on the Wars of the Roses today is really whether there were fundamental flaws at the heart of the English medieval polity. Did these structural and institutional weaknesses make the wars between Lancastrians and Yorkists inevitable? Three areas spring to mind. The first is finance. It's true that for much of the late Middle Ages, the English crown was impoverished, regularly spending more money than it received in taxation, uh, from the royal lands, and from the profits of justice. In the 15th century, the crown's landed income was in decline, partly, of course, because of Edward III's alienations. Edward's policies had also alienated another important fund uh, for the English king, foreign merchants. Edward borrowed money off Italian bankers and Italian merchants and didn't pay them back. By the 15th century, this meant that English kings didn't have access to the kind of credit arrangements that many of their fellow European rulers did. On the other hand, in the 15th century, the commons showed themselves time and time again willing to support kings in their efforts. The best example of this, of course, is Henry V, Henry V's conquest of Normandy between 1419 and 1422 were funded by extraordinarily generous grants by the commons. And it's clear that if there was an active royal, uh, if there was an active king uh, who was pursuing the kind of policies which the, crown, uh, which the crown and the realm could agree on, parliament was more than willing to uh, grant that money to support royal endeavours. The second area where historians have identified institutional weaknesses is in the area of law 
and justice. But this is to fundamentally misunderstand, I think, some of the essential characteristics of how justice operated in the late Middle Ages. Noblemen were not lawless barons who uh, compromised royal justice uh, in the localities, but were a key part of a system of justice which involved both the formal courts at Westminster and the local justice offered by great noblemen. The lordship of important landowners in settling disputes among their peers uh, was absolutely crucial to late medieval law and order. Disputes were settled more often by arbitration and by the involvement of a great magnate than they were by pursuing the matter at law at Westminster. At the heart of this centre of lordship and justice, of course, at the top of the pyramid, was the king himself. If there was an adult king able to fairly adjudicate on the disputes between landowners, then the system worked well. Where the system failed was where there was a failure of royal leadership. The third area is patronage. It is argued that the weakness of the crown lay in part in the uh, generosity of successive English monarchs. But patronage again was a vital tool in lubricating the uh, English polity. The king would give rewards and in, re and in return would expect, um, expect service and loyal service. It was only when the king was injudicious in his patronage that problems occurred. That said, by 1422 there was certainly a sense of crisis uh, in the Lancastrian monarchy. Henry V, the victor of Agincourt and the conqueror of Normandy, of course, had died, leaving his son, Henry VI, a nine-month-old baby as heir to the English throne. But not only heir to the English throne, the Treaty of Troyes in 1420, of course, had settled the French throne on Henry VI as well. It was the implementation of the Treaty of Troyes that caused the uh, beginnings, I think, of the Wars of the Roses. There were serious rifts in the elite over how Henry V's will and his aims in France should be implemented. On the one hand was the Duke of Bedford, the Henry V's brother and, his regent, and Henry VI's regent in France. And on the other hand, Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester, the king's younger uncle and protector of the realm in England. Until 1435-36, these rifts within the elite over how the war in France should be pursued were largely hidden as the political nation came together in the light of the royal minority. The way in which Henry V's legacy gave strength to the Lancastrian polity is evident in, 30, in 1435. In that year, the Duke of Burgundy, formerly the ally of the English, besieged Calais, uh, the English uh, outpost, of course, in Picardy on the uh, uh, French coast. The political nation came together behind Gloucester to defend Calais against the Burgundian threat. And this shows that there was an expectation uh, that the realm uh, owed to the legacy of Henry V and were the realm, the political nation at, at large, was eagerly awaiting Henry VI coming of age uh, to finally give direction to that war effort. The problem of Henry VI's government did not really become apparent until 1435-1436. It was in the summer of 1435 uh, that Henry VI began to assume the duties of an adult king. The problem, of course, with Henry, that he had neither the inclination nor the ability to exercise these fundamental duties of kingship effectively. The character of Henry VI emerges as one of the key reasons why there were wars between the Lancastrians and the Yorkists. Some examples of Henry VI's failures um, come in the question of royal patronage. As we've seen, the king was expected to give out grants, give out favours in return for uh, loyal service. The problem with Henry VI, he was profligate and gave the same office to more than one person. In 1442, for example, he granted the 
stewardship of the Duchy of Cornwall to Sir William Bonville, an office which he had already previously granted to the Earl of Devon, thus provoking a feud between the Bonvilles and the Courtenays which lasted more than a decade and led to a spiral of disorder and eventual open warfare in the southwest. <laughs>